Good morning. We are at Matthew chapter number 27. We're closing in toward the end, ain't we? And we've seen all the, you know, it's kind of hard watching these last few things unfold after seeing everything that Jesus done along the way, all the wonderful things to see how they treat him here at the end. But uh, this is a sobering thought. You know, you see all the, the wickedness that goes on in the world, just horrible thing especially now that we have the internet you can see everything that's going on every five seconds and it's a little much but uh of all that probably still the worst act in human history is this what we're getting ready to read about you know killing the son of god i mean it don't get no worse than that does it and but think about this the worst act in human history and every last detail was orchestrated by god what do I mean by that? I mean, if you don't get nothing else out of Matthew, you at least get the fulfillment of all these prophecies that they were all written before time. Even this stuff at the end here is going to keep on saying he fulfilled this, fulfilled that. And it's some bad stuff that happens to the Lord, and it was all preordained. So that's something to think about sometimes when you sit down at night and wonder if God's truly in control. He is. He knows the end from the, he declares the end from the beginning, actually, is what the word says. But I'm rambling. This is a long one, too. We better get going. It says, uh, when the morning had, was come, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. So in the morning, they're all gathered out, ready to get him. He says, uh, when they had him, when they had him bound, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. That's the first time we see this guy. Pontius Pilate, the governor, the Roman, he was over the, the Roman Empire, put him in charge there in Jerusalem. So, I heard somebody pulling in. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See you to it. Can you imagine, you know, you've done, committed the worst act of treason and treachery in the history of the world, and it it dawns on you, you, you can't take it. Here, take this money back. They're like, you see to that. That don't mean nothing to us. He cast down the 30 pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went out and hanged himself. We discussed this yesterday, you know how I feel about old Judas, but uh, that was part of it, meant to be, and uh, this is what happened to him. Watch what they do with the money. He says, The chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful to put it into the treasury of the temple. Why? Because it was the price of blood. They'd paid Judas to betray him, and they couldn't take that, you know, legally take that into the temple treasury. So what they did is they buy a field with it. He says, They took counsel and bought the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field, and the Lord appointed me, as the Lord appointed me. So you can go look that up in Jeremiah. I think it's more talking about that particular field than uh, maybe Judas. I don't really know. I looked that up one time. but uh, Anyway... Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, You say it. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Again, he's standing like a lamb done before its shears. Then Pilate saith unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against you? And he answered him, Never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. See, anybody else would be, you know, just trying to come up with some excuse to get out of it jesus never answered the word now at that feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would so they had this custom in the feast if they had a prisoner in there the governor could release him and Pilate knew that he thought he was going to get out of this but watch what happens he says uh, there was a notable prisoner called barabbas you'll find out later in some of the other ones he was a thief and a murderer i think and at the very least an insurrectionist but uh it says, Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Who will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? And I think he's thinking, you know, they're going to want Jesus over this Barabbas guy. But he says, For uh, 
because the pilot knew that the the big wigs just delivered Jesus for envy. He's thinking the rest of the you know the common man is going to have Jesus released, but you'll find out in another place the the scribes and Pharisees raises that you know they stir the people up against Jesus. But here it says, when he sat down on the judgment seat, his wife, this is Pilate's wife, sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I've suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. So she's had a dream about Jesus, and it's troubling her. She don't want him put to death. She don't want Pilate to even do nothing about it. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And there's probably a lot of this same crowd that was just the week before saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Now they're getting ready to say crucify him. Pilate said unto them, What shall I do with Jesus? Oh, hang on a second. I skipped ahead. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said unto them, What shall I do with them with Jesus, which is called Christ? That's a big question that we all still need to answer today. What shall I do with Jesus? They all said unto them, to him, let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. But, you know... Pilate wasn't innocent, was he? And neither were we. We can wash our hands all day with water, but until you get washed in the blood, you're going to be just as guilty as these people here. <laughs> then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now, it just blows right through that, but if you've ever watched the movie The Passion of the Christ, when it says he scourged him, that's when they tie him up and take those things and just beat him after death, so... That's tough to think about. It's certainly even tougher to watch. But uh, it says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall, gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him, took off all his clothes, and they put on a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, this ain't like little thorns you get out weed eating, these big giant razor blade looking things, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him, mocking him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. People still mocking him in that fashion today. They spit upon him, took the reed, and smote him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off him and put his own raiment on him, led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Cyrene, I don't know how you say that, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross because Jesus, he'd been beat with an inch of his life. He couldn't, couldn't carry it, so they get this guy to help him. And when they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that's up there on Calvary, that is to say, a place of a skull, that's what that word meant, and that they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, and when he tasted thereof, he would not drink. I mean, who wants to drink vinegar? Especially with gall in it, whatever that is. It says, uh, he would not drink, and they crucified him, and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, they parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. Even that little detail there was prophesied, and it was fulfilled. Sitting down, they washed him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. This reminds me a whole lot of what uh, Satan said to Jesus when he was tempting him in the wilderness. He kept, uh, you know, if you be the Son of God, do this. If you be the Son of God. That's the same spirit that's in these people right here. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, if. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. That's bull. Even if he did come down off there, they still wouldn't believe him because their eyes have been blinded, their hearts have, their hearts have been hardened. It says, He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves, listen to this, the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. So we think about that one thief that, you know, turns and says, Lord, remember me. We think that maybe he was 
had a broken heart when he got up there and was seeking the Lord and all. He was, he was talking bad about him just the same as the rest of them at the beginning. But something happened to him along the way, didn't it? And I don't think you see that till maybe, might be in Luke, Mark or Luke. I think it's Luke. We'll get to it, hopefully. It says, and now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth. So it just got dark. And, you know, the ninth hour is the last one this is when Jesus dies. But from the sixth to the ninth, darkness. Why? Because most of us believe that's when he was made to be sin. That's when the light of this world got turned out because the sin had been put upon him and the wrath of God. And and uh, probably the father had to turn away. That's the first time he really felt separated from the father because he's going to say something that you've heard, you know, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's going on in this total darkness here. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. How's that for my pronunciation? That is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of them stood there, and when they heard that, said, This man calls for Elias, which is Elijah. I don't know. Something in that language made them think he was talking to Elijah, but he said, My God, my God. I don't know. Straightway one of them ran, took a sponge, filled it with vinegar, put it on a reed, and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let it be. Let us see whether Elias comes to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, as soon as he dies, watch what stuff, stuff starts happening here. The veil in the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. Now, if you go back and study the tabernacle in the temple, you had the 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 main part, the sanctuary, you had the holy place where the, the furniture was, the showbread, the lampstand, all this stuff. But then you had the holy of holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was with the law. Nobody could go in there except the high priest. That's where this veil was. That's where, you know, used to in Moses' day, that's where God met. You know, that's where the glory of God came in. And only one guy could go in one day a year. But when the veil got rent in twain, that opened up the way for all of us to, with boldness, and by the grace of God, present ourselves right directly to him through Jesus. It says the, the veil rent in twain. It says the earth did quake, the rocks rent. The graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. You don't hear nothing about that. I mean, that's... People got up out of the grave and walked around, seen by many. I don't know. I've tried to look into that a little bit, but I ain't really satisfied with any of the, of the things I've read on it, so I ain't even going to comment. That's just... You think about that. When Jesus died... People got up out of the grave and started walking around. That's pretty much that's pretty something. Isn't it? And you know what? When he comes back, people's going to get up out of the grave, and we ain't going to be walking around. We're going to jump up in the air and meet him and go forever be with the Lord. That's even better. He says, uh, now when the centurion, that's the Roman soldier, that's probably the one that's, I don't know, if he helped nail him to the cross or maybe the one that poked him in the side, and maybe he was just there. But it says the centurion that was there with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. I mean, how can you not believe after seeing something like that? But, you know, a lot of them don't. We ask that question. How can you believe when Jesus has showed you so many things, and yet you don't? It takes the Lord, doesn't it? It takes him to open up your heart, your ears, and your eyes. Okay, it says, And many women were there, beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary, mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. When the evening was come, excuse me, <clears throat> there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. Now that was prophesied too. I don't think it mentions it there, but he shall make his grave with the rich or something like that. I can't remember how it goes, but this rich man gave him his tomb in which nobody had ever laid. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulchre. Now the next day that followed, the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, 
Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will arise again. <laughs> so they heard Jesus say that, and they're going to try to set something up to combat that. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be, be made sure unto the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so that the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the sepulchre. I can't say that. They made it sure, sealing up the stone and setting a watch. And you'll find out, I don't know if it's in the last chapter here or one of the other gospels, they said that he came in. When he actually does rise, they make that lie up that they come and stole his body away and all that. And a lot of them, it said, believe that to that day. But, uh, he got up, didn't he? Amen. We're going to see that in the last chapter, and glory to God. We'll try to see you in the morning.